Have the lyrics to a song ever slapped you in the face? One of the resources I've been reading as we've gone through our series on the book of Genesis is Theodore Epps, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. On about the last page of this book, I stumbled across the 1874 Theodore Monod hymn, None of Self and All of Thee. It blew me away. Notice the progression in this song. Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be when I let the Savior's pity plead in vain and proudly answered, all of self and none of thee. Yet he found me. I beheld him bleeding on the cursed tree, heard him pray, forgive them, Father, and my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day is tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, sweet and strong and also patient, brought me lower while I whispered, less of self and more of thee. Higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord, thy love at last hath conquered. Grant me now my heart's petition, none of self and all of thee. If you could really absorb the message of the song, I could just about wrap up the message, our sermon, and we could have a number of extra songs this morning. Monod traces his personal transition from the world to spiritual infancy, to spiritual adolescence, and finally to spiritual maturity. This morning, I want you to be able to stop and evaluate with me where you are with respect to these four stages. It's one matter not to know something, but it's a different matter entirely not to know what you don't know. So this morning, look at the man or woman in the mirror and ask yourself honestly, where am I and how can I move forward? We'll tackle this morning's message under new management. But first, a song. Down deep in my soul. Nothing compares to that glorious feeling when the material man meets the spiritual realm in baptism on, of course, the heels of faith, repentance, and confession of Christ. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 6, verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What does the Spirit mean by newness of life? He tells us in Romans chapter 6, verses 20 through 22, that it means if we want to move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear Son, we must go from being slaves of sin to being slaves of God. How's that for a before and after contrast? The reality, according to Scripture, is that 
you are a slave. It's just a question of who is your master. Later he tells us in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Did you catch that? Transformation. That's what we signed up for when we were baptized, and that's what repentance is all about. When we become Christians, we could wear a shirt or put a sign in the front yard that said, under new management, because that's exactly what's supposed to happen. Of course, if we are truly under new management, the world would notice without the shirt or the yard sign. The point is, of course, the old boss, self, didn't cut it. He or she just messed things up. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 6, 21, what fruit, did, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. That didn't work very well for me. Did it work well for you? The end, we realize, to that type of behavior and lifestyle is eternal destruction. But even before we stare that situation in the face, aren't we ashamed of our foolish activities before Christ? Listen, friend. The whole idea of Christianity is turning the broken pieces of our life over to Jesus, who can still yet make something beautiful out of it. God can turn broken pieces into masterpieces, but that only happens when we do it His way. Let's look back at the song we noticed in our introduction, tracing the stages of growth that Monod presents. Those who have been genuine Christians for 40 years, 50 years, or longer, perhaps can look back and more readily recognize these transitions in their own life. Where do you fall closest to now within these four stages? We have a visual. All of self and none of thee, the world. Some of self and some of thee, spiritual infancy. Less of self and more of thee, spiritual adolescence, or none of self and all of thee, spiritual maturity. Let's consider the stages of personal growth in relation to Christ using a me to thee continuum. As one man put it, you cannot exalt God and yourself at the same time. This graphic should describe the direction we're headed in our spiritual journey from big me to big thee. Instead of remaining out in sin in the world, see a giant me, thinking we have all the answers and able to navigate through life independently, we need to be developing more and more fully the attitude expressed by the prophet in Isaiah 6 verse 8, here am I, Lord, send me rather than looking to God as some kind of a genie in a bottle that we only appeal to in some great emergency, not saying, as it were, Jesus, wash my feet, but Jesus, let me wash your feet, see John 13. We notice the necessity of baptism for salvation in Romans 6, but we need to understand that that is just the beginning. It's not over then. God clearly has a plan for our lives after baptism. Look at Colossians 1, verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus is not a mask. Christianity is not a mere mask that we put on every Sunday morning at the worship assembly. That makes us not any different than the hypocritical Pharisees who wore their masks of godliness at the temple and in the synagogue, but had no spiritual depth. Talking Christian speak is no substitute for having Jesus deep within your heart and soul. God wants us to do more than have the gospel on our lips. Satan quotes scripture. See Matthew 4. We need to have Jesus 
on the outside <coughs> and on the inside. We must be in Christ and Christ must be in us, John 15. He expects us to obey him. Hebrews 5, 9. The Apostle Paul accentuates this truth in Galatians 4, 19. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. If they were as determined to see this as the Apostle Paul, it would have already happened. But the scripture that really drives this home is Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Crucified with Christ, not literally nailed to a cross, but putting the flesh to death so there is room for Jesus to live through us. One of the beauties of dying to sin and driving a nail through the flesh is that we insulate ourselves against the enemy. You see, you can't hurt a dead man, one who's truly died to Christ, one who's crucified the flesh. This whole idea of beating down the flesh, of getting beyond myself, runs counter to the natural man. McDonald's maxim, you deserve a break today, was rated top advertising jingle of the 20th century. They only recently dropped the rights to it after 43 years. And what's the message? It's all about me. All of me and none of anybody else. Except, of course, as they may benefit me, psychologists, advertisers, and churches promote the importance of me, not self-denial as Jesus emphasizes. Instead, the importance of enhancing our own self-image. But is this idea biblical? It's okay to be self-absorbed when we're infants. We have one response, wah, for being angry, hungry, tired, or wet. Now that form of communication is fine at 12 months, but not at 12 years. When we're born again, we're babes in Christ and not as much as expected of us in spiritual infancy. But if we have been Christians for 5, 10, or 20 years, and we're still on a pacifier, something is dangerously, unacceptably wrong. The Hebrew writer lamented this very state among first century Jewish Christians in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We owe it to Jesus to stay on track. Before we delve back into the key elements of the song we notice, let's consider some self words. Not everything that pertains to self is undesirable. Some self words, though, we view as negative, <clears throat> clearly. Selfish, self-centered, self-aggrandizement, self-indulgent, self-interest, self-seeking, self-serving, self-righteous, self-willed, and self-destructive. Other self words we view as Positive words, and they center around three ideas. Number one, the ability to tell ourselves no. Self-discipline, self-denial, self-restraint, self-regulation, self-control. Number two, they center around the ability to esteem others higher than self, those who are selfless, self-effacing, and self-deprecating. And number three, the ability to carefully monitor our thoughts, words, and deeds. Self-awareness, self-examination. Back to our song, though, all of self and none of thee. Here I think of Frank Sinatra. I did it my way, and that's the way so often we want to do it. At this stage, we are independent as men and women of the world. We have it all figured out. 
We certainly don't need God's help. We're not listening to God and perhaps not listening to anyone else. We have the world by the tail. Really, we're talking pride. When we look at the big me side of the me, the continuum, C.S. Lewis wrote, there is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine they are guilty themselves. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular, and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. The vice I am talking of is pride or self-conceit, and the virtue opposite to it in Christian morals is called humility. That's right. We can't stand it in anyone else, and yet if we're honest, we can see how pride has been a major issue in all of our lives. Lewis adds, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Andrew Murray adds in his book, Humility, pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. I think of Muhammad Ali. He didn't beat around the bush. I am the greatest. He also said, if you even dream of beating me, you'd better wake up and apologize. Ordinarily, nobody is that outwardly selfish or self-absorbed. Is that right, though? My dad has a note in the margin of his Bible in Matthew 9, verse 32 through 34. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. Dad's note, refused to admit obvious truth. Rejecting obvious truth is nothing but pride, a devotion to my previous thoughts and practices. We see this often and can fall prey ourselves because truth can be very inconvenient. His fundamental theology was flawed, but Thomas Dubay was right when he said, the humble person is open to being corrected, whereas the arrogant is clearly closed to it. Proud people are supremely confident in their own opinions and insights. No one can admonish them successfully. They know, and that is the end of the matter. Filled as they are with their own views, the arrogant lack the capacity to see another view. In a similar vein, Alexander Pope offered the sage advice, a man should never be ashamed to own that he has been in the wrong, which is but saying, in other words, that he is wiser today than he was yesterday. It's all about deciding to put thee above me. If you're not a Christian or if you're away from God, this is where you are. You need to move up to the next level, some of self and some of thee. We're calling this spiritual infancy. I think of Laodicea in the some of self, some of thee category. They were Christians little more than in name only. Some Christians have just enough Christianity to make them miserable. Others believe in teamwork or our way, thee and me, as long as I'm the one charting the course. In other words, I want you along, God, but I'll let you know when I need you. I'll be the pilot, God. You be the co-pilot. Why would you put God in as the co-pilot? As one man said, if you're the pilot, and God is the co-pilot, you better change seats. Similarly, at this stage, our approach to Christianity can be, how little can I contribute to the effort while still being on the team? Is this where you are? If so, work towards the next level. Less of self and more of thee. We're calling this spiritual adolescence. We've made some real progress, but we still have a ways to go. As Hemingway put it, there is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. We cannot be satisfied. I think of what John the Baptist said in John 3, verse 30. 
We cannot be satisfied. I must decrease, he must increase. Here, we want it to be our way, but we're ready for God to be the pilot. Still, though, at times it's unclear who is running the show. We're back and forth. Abraham Lincoln said, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seemed in insufficient for that day. We must grow to the point where going to God in His Word and going to God in prayer is not the last place, but the first place we go. This is true humility. None of self and all of thee. That is the place we all need to be striving for when we finally trust God and we finally trust His way unreservedly. We give God our all and we follow Scripture no matter what changes and difficulties it presents. Isn't this the message behind the greatest commandments? Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I surrender all, not just Sunday morning, not just the issues that are easy for me, but you have my everything in everything. Here is a statement of spiritual maturity that we should all own as Christians. Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Not what do I want, not what does the world want, but what does Jesus want? This is the great challenge, central to the transformation that Jesus expects to see in true disciples. The word Christian is not something to be used lightly. Andrew Murray rightly believed that humility is perfect quietness of heart. It is to expect nothing, to wonder at nothing that is done to me, to feel nothing done against me. It is to be at rest when nobody praises me and when I am blamed or despised. It is to have a blessed home in the Lord where I can go in and shut the door and kneel to my Father in secret and am at peace as in a deep sea of calmness when all around and above is trouble. Isn't that where you want to be? It is certainly God's will for you. Surely you're tired of juggling all the consequences of your past mistakes and misdeeds. There must be a better way. And there is God's way. Why don't you place your life under new management today? If you've been the pilot and you've had God in as co-pilot, why don't you switch seats? We hope you'll stay with us. We'll tell you how you can get a free copy of this message after our song. There is no man in the New Testament who exemplifies better for us what it means 
to be under new management than Saul of Tarsus. After his Damascus Road experience, everything changed. He was a totally different man from going towards Damascus to persecute Christians with a bold, high-stepping attitude. He was led by the hand into Damascus. And it was there where he learned what he needed to do to begin this new walk, to begin this new change, to initiate this great transformation. We read about that in Acts 22 after he had acknowledged Christ on the Damascus Road, after he had demonstrated repentance by uh, uh, fasting and prayer, praying a sinner's prayer. He still wasn't saved. In Acts 22, verse 16, we find that Ananias told him, And now, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. Why don't you begin this new transformation today? We'd be happy to help you. Of course, we're glad you joined us this morning, and we hope you'll tune in every Lord's Day, and then join us for worship at one of the congregations listed shortly. The Apostle Peter's inspired message in Acts 2.38 is still valid today. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Call or write for a copy of number 1047 under new management. You may also request a free Bible study course by mail. We close with the words of the Apostle Paul issued in Romans 16, verse 16. The churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.